Um, so yes, it's great to be uh, here with you all as someone who both practices here and teaches here and feels like I can move between those spaces. Um, and yeah, the topic that Melvin and I are diving into tonight with you all, uh, healing the wounds of Christianity, just like wanting to own and name like Christianity is like, it's a big topic. <laughs> um, and recognizing like, you know, like looking at who's here and what I know of some folks, like, I know there's people here who go to church, you know, so there's like Christianity isn't like all thrown out the door here. And there's probably people here who have never been to church and yet are still impacted um, because of the broad scope of Christianity across the globe. Um, and I think it's perhaps a common understanding across many folks here that, uh, and part of what Melvin and I are exploring about how Christianity helped drive European empire building. And so it feels like a core part of trying to understand white supremacy and patriarchy. And certainly in queer and trans community, I know a lot of us have some somewhat particular stories of harm through Christianity. So even as Melvin and I may tell some particular stories tonight of our own experiences growing up in Christianity and how that plays out, trying to hold kind of a broader picture of, um, of the wounds that are here um, and, and that are, are present here. And just like asking us, our, asking the question, what would it be like if the wounds of Christianity were healed? What could be possible? Yeah, and how do we bring that wounding into our, as Don was saying at the beginning, uh, into our um, meditation spaces, our other spiritual um, experiences, homes, into our personal lives. Um, and we feel like we're, um, Don and I, breaking a taboo that talking about Christianity um, is just like any other system of domination um, doesn't want to be talked about. Um, and that's a way that it maintains power over um, people. And, um, so we, Don and I, um, have done um, some exploring about our personal histories and we're gonna each share an object that represents um, our experience growing up um, in Christianity and our family of origin. Um, our families of origin. Don, did you, you, you wanna go first? Or you wanna... We didn't discuss that. I can go first if you want me to. Okay, yeah. Um, um, sure. So yeah, this is a this is a practice coming out of our drama therapy work is just kind of sharing an object. So one of the objects I, I didn't actually think I had any objects still in my home that represented growing up in Christianity, but then I remembered I still have my high school jewelry box. It's very pink. Anyone comes from that time, you might remember Kit and Caboodle. And you open it up and there's little like spaces to hold the little piece of jewelry. My favorite that I might, if I had, can like make my earring hole happen again, I, there's these cute little pink ones that I still like, but that's not what we're here to talk about. 
Um, what we're here to talk about is this little cross that I still own and that I probably wore every day. I don't remember exact. I feel like my parents probably gave it to me as a as a birthday present or, or a Christmas present. Um, but I'm pretty sure I definitely wore it every day this year where I was trying really hard to be a perfect Christian. And this was the year after I had um, pretty much every year, uh, middle school and high school, I went to this camp called Christian Athletic Camp. And I mostly kept going because I wanted to stay connected to some uh, friends of mine after we'd moved from Indiana to Michigan. And it was, uh, there was this one year I went to camp after I had lost some weight. And this was the year that the camp decided to give me an award as the Christian athlete of the year. Now it was clear to me that I had not actually improved my athletic abilities. <laughs> Or, and I had not actually improved how like my upstandingness as a Christian. And that it was likely the only reason that they were giving me the award is because I had lost weight, <laughs> which to me is really shitty. And like, even though there was like some part of me as a 16 year old that was like excited that I had lost weight, I was also really angry at them for validating that as like, as like a the like Christian athlete of the year. And so the convoluted way that my my 16 year old brain tried to resolve that tension was to prove that I was actually I deserved it because I was a like I actually was a better Christian. And so I read the entire Bible from cover to cover that year and I wore this necklace every day. I like drug my mom to church <laughs> um, so that I could be like, oh, this is why. This is why they gave me the award, not because of their fat phobia, but because I, I deserved it because of my Christian upstanding nature <laughs> that, they, that they knew about previously. Um, so uh, when I was showing Melvin this, he asked me then like, well, when did you stop wearing it? And I was like, oh, well, I stopped wearing it when I went to college and I tried really hard to find another church to continue to be a good upstanding Christian. And I found one that was close to my dorm and I really liked the kind of singing they did. And then, um, after I'd been going for a few weeks, I saw their sign about uh, groups that they were running to um, uh, kind of like train people out of being gay. And I was like, and at that time I was so disembodied that I uh, did not actually understand my own queerness but I knew that I was at least allied with queer people. Like I knew that about myself. And so I was like, I just like couldn't sleep that whole week knowing that I um, had been going to this church and they, they not only didn't accept homosexuality, they, were, they believed that you could like, like reprogram people. And so I stopped going to that church and basically stopped going to church at all. And it was a long time before I even was like willing to step foot in any kind of spiritual anything of any kind, um, because it just felt really off limits um, after that experience. So. I think I'll pause there and we can share more, but I'd like to hear Melvin's story. Thanks, Don. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I can really resonate a lot. And um, I'm gonna, yeah, so it's lots of hearts, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna share my object in a picture or a screen. Um, this is um, something, a picture, many of you probably recognize. Um, that's because I looked today over a billion copies of this um, visage of uh, Jesus was um, produced. Uh, there was an artist in 1940, um, Salman is, what's his last name? And he made um, what we might say today, hashtag white Jesus up. And um, that painting made it all over the world, including to my grandmother's house in El Salvador. Um, so it actually breaks my heart to even explain, this is separate, but related to have to explain where El Salvador is. I hopefully most people know it's in Central America. And the colonialism and imperialism, the US sponsored like violence and terrorism that happened in my mother's home country um, involved uh, Christianity and this painting making its way there. And I was raised Seventh-day Adventist um, and they, those missionaries made it to El Salvador in the early 1900s. And I come from a line, a, a couple of generations of, um, of pastors, Seventh-day Adventist pastors. And it's this weird um, reverse colonialism <laughs> in that that was the way my great uncle, my grandparents were able to come to the US in the late 60s because they had a religious visa, because they were members and uh, ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I um, had this picture growing up around the house and where stuff started to go um, um, queer <laughs> was when I um, was 12 and my grandmother died and she was really religious. I credit her for teaching me how to meditate because she would read the Bible every morning. And, um, and so seeing her be really um, connected in, in, a, in a deep way, um, I credit that me being 11 years old and having experienced meditation in, in that way. Um, and the, is, the death of my grandmother brought um, was at the same time that puberty started happening. So I started having um, the crushes that I had um, of my male um, classmates become more of a full bodied experience. Um, and my grandma had just died. So I thought that she, um, was uh, punishing me, like cursing me, because I was um, coming out as, as queer. And that that ended up making a big uh, wound in my psyche that in my, how many years I've been meditating now, something like 15, 20 years, that that's been like the biggest challenge in my meditation quote unquote practice is that recon like being reconciling or being okay with fantasy as a way to avoid trauma um, and how fantasy is natural and required for sexual expression, but that when I've gone on meditation retreats and it's like never talked about like the, the taboo of sexuality and how queer sexuality and adding that layer of Christianity on top of it was something that um, took me a long time to work through. Um, and meditation has been 
um, I'm really pissed because no one, what I learned in my, what I took in through meditation instructions was like that if my mind wasn't on the present, if I was fantasizing, if I was, you know, then that was doing something wrong. And because it was in that chasm, that deep wound um, that I would fall into again and again. And which is why the, our song, our alphabet song is so important has been really important to me and continues to be is that we we get to share our our stories and how um you know how um how they're not talked about how our stories aren't talked about how they're hidden how they're um in the christian verbiage how they're evil you know how they're um sinful and so, um, I mean, the last part of just coming back to the picture is that I had a crush on that Jesus. But it's cute. And then, and, but it's hella racist, right? Um, it's white Jesus, it's like Nordic God, Jesus. And, um, and then the patriarchal part of it, it's that um, I think coming into Buddhism, I was found an easier time with it because um, Buddhism is also a patriarchal lineage, you know, and, and so that where I have um, more healing to do is to see how I can um, um, how I can be um, continue to be aware of how that saviorism comes up, um, how that, um, like I'm, I'm the one that's, that knows it all or something, or that if I just think right, get right with God, or that I'm favored by God, or, you know, or these kind of things. Um, so checking that, um, those manifestations is, um, interesting, um, and I think I think very healing, and um, and also reclaiming my my right to be um, fully loved and accepted, um, and 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 whole, you know. And, um, so I'll just I'll just I'll just stop there. Um, thanks for for listening to that part of my life. Yes.